Hey guys, and welcome back. So as we close out this chapter on the invertebrates, I just kind of want to recap from where we started, what we were talking about with this whole idea behind zoology and studying all these animals. We looked at this pie chart here, and I asked you to look at what you noticed. And we talked about how 95% of this pie chart is nothing but invertebrates. And so that's what our chapter was on. It was over 95% of this. Now for the last two weeks, and including this week, so I guess the last three weeks, we've been doing nothing but invertebrates. For the last two weeks, we've basically talked about our mollusks, we've talked about the sponges, we've talked about nadarians, we talked about echinoderms, we talked about our different types of worms, but what we haven't talked about yet are our crustaceans, our myriapods, our arachnids, and our insects. Look how huge, I just want you to look at this, and a lot of people say clearly insects have been the most successful creature that has ever lived. and. This kind of attests to that number. Now, again, the reason for this, why do you think we find so many insects, so many arthropods? Well, we can be lucky that most of them are relatively small. And so that's another reason they've been able to diversify as much as they have been able to. But also because of the jobs that they have to do, the different things that they are responsible for, there needs to be large numbers of these animals. And so we're going to be looking at this large portion of animals today. And insects, arachnids, crustaceans, and myriapods all make up one giant phylum. And so if you're following along with your notes, you'll notice that it might say uh, arthropoda and then insecta and then arthropoda, arachnids, and that's because each one of these is a group within the phylum we're going to be talking about today, which are the arthropods, arthropoda. And so again, arthropods are the most successful group of animals on earth. They have diversified more than anything else. In fact, insects alone, like we saw here, have basically uh, over a million estimated species alone. And that's about over half of all the known species to live on the earth. And so your insects, your arachnids, your crustaceans, your centipedes, millipedes, your myriapodas, uh, these all make up the arthropods. And all these arthropods have several key characteristics that they all have in common, that they have to share in order to be arthropods. The first obvious one is probably their exoskeleton. All arthropods have an exoskeleton. They don't have an, an endoskeleton like we do. They don't have an internal skeleton. Likewise, they still don't even have bones, but they do have a skeleton in the sense that they have this external defensive armor, you could say, that's made out of a protein called chitin. And these are all going to be made out of chitin. And so they have that uh, exoskeleton there. They're going to have some calcium and different things in it too, but the main component is going to be chitin. And the other main characteristic of all arthropods is that they have jointed appendages. Appendages are just things like feet, all right, or antennae. And this characteristic right here is actually how the phylum gets its namesake. Arthro means joint, pod means feet or appendage. And so the jointed appendages. All these animals here, you can see like this lobster's claws, they have these joints on them. 
these spiders legs have joints uh, even this horseshoe crab even though he's upside or uh, you can't see necessarily he has joints all these animals have jointed appendages now we have joints too but ours are different and we don't have an exoskeleton likewise our bodies aren't divided into segments you could say we have different areas or cavities but we don't have segments like a millipede here has a bunch of segments or this bee here has three body segments or the spider has two body segments our bodies aren't divided like that but all arthropods are likewise some internal anatomy that we can't necessarily see that they're all going to share is that they have an open circulatory system if you remember from last week doing the terminology of the earthworm and looking at the structure of the earthworm they would have what's called a closed circulatory system we too have a closed circulatory system and if you remember when we talked about that a closed circulatory system is when the blood doesn't mix with any other fluid it stays in its vessels in other words it stays in the arteries the veins the capillaries and it doesn't get mixed in with the all the other bodily fluids however all these creatures that belong to the arthropods have what's known as an open circulatory system and in an open circulatory system yes they are going to have a, a primitive heart that's going to pump this fluid around known as hemolymph but this fluid is kind of not just their blood but it, it contains their nutrients it contains their waste again they have digestive systems and excretory tubes to help with that but nonetheless it's all being filtered through the same fluid and so that's why it's called an open circulatory system and they are going to have uh, a nervous system like a main ventral nervous system and compound eyes all right that's important if you've ever seen uh, just any insect up close under a microscope or something like that you know what I'm talking about when I say they have compound eyes and it's not just your insects it's your crustaceans as well it's your arachnids and even your millipedes centipedes they're all going to have compound eyes and so let's go ahead and now we're going to look at the different large groups of arthropods one by one and then we'll close with talking about the main life cycles of some of these so first up we have the crustaceans or crustacea uh, these include crabs, lobsters, shrimp, copepods, which are these right here. To be honest, I've never seen any this pretty, these colorful. And these are actually really, really tiny. Uh, think about, like, you can see them with the naked eye. In other words, if you were looking for them, you could see them. But it would just look like a speck of sand almost swimming around. That's how tiny these are. And these are little egg sacs. But those are copepods. And then your roly polies or your isopods. And you guys know you've heard me talking enough about them. I love uh, isopods, these little land crustaceans. And that's another key thing about crustaceans is most of them are actually going to live in marine or freshwater environments because they breathe through gills. However, your isopods and some of your what are called land shrimp are the exceptions uh, where they are going to still use gills but they can just live in damp moist environments instead they're also going to have two sets of antennae you can see those very easily here on this lobster you can see the one set here the other one there and then they're going to have more than three pairs of walking legs or appendages that they're going to be using for example, isopods are generally going to have seven pairs. And then you can see here that uh, our little um, crab here, he has these four, these four sets with the two claws. And uh, they're also generally going to have two body segments. Not always. Sometimes they'll have more but most cases they're going to be divided in what's known as a cephalothorax and their abdomen 
And this word is going to come up again in one of our groups. And what I want you to realize is cephala is referring to head, like when we were talking about the cephalopods, like our squids and our octopus. The cephalothorax is referring to the head and thorax that are fused together. And so I just kind of added this little piece in here again because I've talked to you guys about them before. And uh, these isopods, sometimes you'll hear them called roly polies or pill bugs. I believe they were called roly polies in uh, Bugs Life. That's what these two guys were. The little, uh, it's supposed to be like the Russian gymnast. They were actually isopods. And uh, you'll find them underneath like rotting logs or decaying leaves and things like that because they are detrivores, just like some of our other aquatic crustaceans as well. All right, up next is uh, Chiclopoda, and these are all of our centipedes. Uh, centipedes are basically characterized by their long, uh, their long bodies that are divided into many, many segments. And uh, on each one of these segments, you'll notice that each segment has its own pair of legs, uh, even at the back here. At the back end and the front end of our centipede, the appendages have actually been modified. For example, on our uh, front here, they've been modified as like these jaws that kind of help capture their prey and inject venom. But these guys are all terrestrial. In other words, they all live on land. And the thing I want you to know about the Chiclopoda is that for each body segment, they have one pair of legs. All right, so centipedes have one pair of legs per body segment. The diplopoda, your millipedes, are actually going to have two pairs of legs per segment. And just like the centipedes, they are going to have these long bodies with many, many segments. Uh, but that does not mean that because we call them millipedes, that they have thousands of legs or a thousand legs or a thousand body segments. Same with centipedes. Just because they're called a centipede, centa we think a hundred. But it doesn't mean that they're going to have a hundred legs or a hundred body segments. It just refers to the creature. And so the way that you can remember them apart, it's not that centipedes have a hundred legs and millipedes have a thousand legs, but it's that centipedes have one pair of legs per segment and millipedes have two pairs of legs per segment. So again, the millipedes are going to have more legs, but that doesn't mean that they're going to have a thousand legs. Then we come to the arachnids, or arachnidia. These include your spiders, they include scorpions, ticks, vinegaroons, and horseshoe crabs. I wonder how many of you guys have ever been to the beach and you've seen maybe some of these dried up or washed up on shore and uh, just thought they looked like this really cool prehistoric crab, which they do. However, they're not actually a crab. And this is also, again, if you remember all the way back when we talked about classification and scientific names, this is another reason scientific names are important is because sometimes common names can be misleading. For example, horseshoe crab. You think it's a crab, but it's not. It's actually a type of arachnid. And the reason it gets grouped with the arachnids, like our spiders and our scorpions and our vinegaroons, is because they have something known as chelicerae. And if you've ever tried counting the legs on a spider, like this one here, he has four legs on each side, so counting up to eight. But if you look closely right here, kind of see like it looks like he has uh, two more legs, like a fifth pair of legs. And those actually aren't legs, but those are little appendages known as the chelicerae or the chelicerata. And what these actually do is they are kind of like little arms, and maybe you can see it on this one here. That's a little bit harder. But nonetheless, they kind of help them grab their prey. And uh, even right here on the scorpion. They're little claws. Those are the chelicerae. 
and even these horseshoe crabs have the chelous ray. And so that's one of the characteristics of arachnids, as well as, again, having the two-part bodies where they have a cephalothorax and then their abdomen. And this is another characteristic of arachnids. Look at their cephalothorax. Look at their head. It's the head and the thorax that's fused together. And because of this, that's also where their feet or their appendages are going to be attached to. Their appendages are attached directly to the body segment that would be their head. And then their abdomen doesn't have any on it. Uh, and so those are your arachnids. Now, another thing, some of you guys might be wondering, what is a vinegaroon? This thing right here is a vinegaroon. And some people call them a false scorpion or a whip scorpion. And again, they are related in the sense that they're both arachnids. But where a scorpion has a stinger, a vinegaroon, as its name implies, actually shoots vinegar out of this little straw here that's on its back. And that kind of deters predators. All right. And last but not least, the largest of the arthropod groups, insecta. In other words, your insects. These include things like your honeybees, grasshoppers, houseflies, lice, praying mantis, beetles, butterflies, moths, grasshoppers, you name it just about. And it's probably going to be an insect. Our characteristics of our insects, this should be pretty simple all the way back from second grade. But nonetheless, let's go through it. They have three pairs of legs. One, two, three. They're also going to have three body segments. They're going to have a head, a thorax, which is where all three body or all three leg sets are actually going to attach to, and then the abdomen, which is of course like the, the end of our insect. And most insects are going to have wings, and when they have wings, they're generally going to have two sets of wings. If you look at our little beetle down here, that hard shell that it looks like he has on the outside, that's actually a modified set of wings. And then he has his other wings for flight underneath. Same with our butterfly here. Here's one, two, three, four. Four wings, so two sets of wings. Now, not all insects are actually going to have wings. For example, lice, uh, most termites, and uh, a lot of your ants, <clears throat> and even your silverfish, they're generally not going to have wings and uh, bed bugs. But other than that, most of your insects are going to have wings. And this right here is what a lot of people also believe is the reason why insects have been able to succeed as well as they have and diversify and have so many different species is because they are the only arthropods that have the ability to fly and even the ability to develop wings. And the way these wings develop differs from insect to insect depending on which phase of metamorphosis they use. So let's go ahead and now look at those different phases of metamorphosis. So the first phase we're going to look at is what's known as incomplete metamorphosis. First of all, before we go any farther, let's just break apart this word metamorphosis. Meta means to change, morphosis, uh, to make basically, to make something uh, to form something, and so we are changing, we're forming something new out of this creature. And uh, metamorphosis, we often kind of think of like butterflies and different things like that, but it also refers to pretty much anything that's going through a change. But if it's an incomplete metamorphosis, well, whenever the insect is born or hatches from the egg, it's basically going to look like a miniature adult. And all these stages that look like miniature adults are what we call a nymph. So this is, these are the nymph stages. And then once it finally becomes, once the insect finally becomes sexually mature, in other words, 
when the insect can reproduce, then we consider it a full formed adult insect. And so those are the three stages we have our egg, the nymph stage, and then the adult. And so this happens with some, or actually most of our groups known as the true bugs. In fact, that's what this guy is up here. He's a true bug. Uh, and then it happens with our dragonflies and with things like our earwigs. And the dragonfly sometimes can be a little tricky or misleading in the sense that they don't often start out looking like a smaller version of the adult. They have to go through quite a bit within their nymph stage, but nonetheless, this is still considered incomplete metamorphosis. In other words, they're not going through a complete change. It's not that drastic. They start out looking like the adults, but like a baby form, and then they slowly turn into that adult. However, complete metamorphosis uh, is just as it sounds. There's a complete change from what the organism starts out looking at to what it turns into. I'm finished! Finally, I'm a beautiful butterfly! Ah! <laughs> And so in complete metamorphosis, we actually have four stages. We have the egg, the larva, pupa, and the adult. The larva is the state of the insect that we are most familiar seeing before it becomes an adult. The larva, for example, of a butterfly or a moth would be a caterpillar. And in fact, uh, I don't know about where you guys are at, but right now around my house, we have a bunch of oak trees and there's all these different moth caterpillars that keep falling out from the sky and everything. Uh, not out of the sky, but you know what I mean, out of the trees. And it's simply because of the time of year it is, you know, all the moths have laid their eggs, those eggs have hatched, they're turning into caterpillars, and eventually those caterpillars, those larvae, are going to enter their pupa state. And when the insect is in its pupa state, this is kind of seen as a period of inactivity or dormancy in the sense of uh, the insect itself isn't doing a lot of activities where it's going around eating like it did in the larva state. But instead, this is where a lot of those adult features are starting to develop. And so for sticking with our butterfly and moth example here, that would be the chrysalis or the cocoon. Chrysalis is for a butterfly, a cocoon is for a moth. But nonetheless, during the chrysalis or the cocoon phase, that is the pupa state of this insect. Other ones, like beetles, uh, sometimes you'll find these grubs in the ground. And if you find a really big grub, that's probably because it comes from a really big beetle, something like a rhinoceros beetle or even a Hercules beetle. And uh, that beetle is still actually going through its larval state. Eventually, it will get to this point where you see it where it kind of really curls up and then it kind of has this weird shell, almost looks like something from like an alien movie that kind of freezes it in time, almost like a sarcophagus you could think of. And that right there is the pupa state of a beetle. And when it's ready, the adult will emerge out, and there you have your beetle. Same with our butterflies. It's from the chrysalis state that our full-fledged adult butterfly will emerge. And that's when we knew, know if we have a uh, adult in complete metamorphosis. For incomplete metamorphosis, we didn't know if it was an adult until we were sure that they were sexually mature. Oftentimes this happens when they fully develop their wings. That's one way you can know that they're sexually mature. But another way is just if we're talking about complete metamorphosis, when they come out from the pupa 
from the pupil state, so like coming out of the chrysalis or coming molting out of this exoskeleton, and then we see the appearance of an adult, that's when we know we have an adult insect. Another one that's not featured up here is uh, your honeybees. Uh, honeybees, ants, even termites, they all go through complete metamorphosis. Uh, flies even go through complete metamorphosis. When you see maggots, uh, those are the larvae of these flies. If you see like the little fly casings, I'll probably show you guys later some of my fruit fly cultures that I use for our frogs in the classroom. And you can see those casings on there. Those cases are actually the pupa states of the flies. But again, just to kind of recap these last two things we talked about. Incomplete metamorphosis, you have an egg, and then the developing insect is known as a nymph until it becomes sexually mature or can reproduce, and then it's called an adult. In complete metamorphosis, however, you have the egg, and then once the egg hatches, we're in what's known as a larval state. And this larval state, another thing to remember about it, it looks nothing like the end result. This is why it's called a complete metamorphosis, because it's completely going to change what it looks like. And it does this during the pupa state. And once it emerges from the pupal state, it's a full-formed adult. And so that's actually going to wrap it up for us today. Remember, we do have a test on Friday over the invertebrates. It is open note. It is open book. And if you have any questions, let me know. Finally, I'm a beautiful butterfly.